Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Titus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Let's just stop right there. Well, I tell you, this is hard for a lot of people in our society today. Everybody wants to do their own thing. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody wants to let anybody be uh, over them or uh, act superior. And of course, he's not talking about an arrogant leader here. He's just saying, remind people, remind people to be subject to rulers. Who are rulers? Rulers are people that have a position of authority. This definitely could be in the church, but I believe this goes beyond the church. It goes into governmental authorities. Well, think about this. He's talking to Titus on the island of, uh, who is on the island of Crete, and he's telling him, hey, set in order the things that are lacking, appoint elders in all the cities on the island of Crete. And of course, within each city are some house churches, but There'd be a church in this city and a church in that city, just like Ephesus and Corinth and such. Those aren't on the island of Crete. But nonetheless, it would be similar to that. Well, now he's coming and saying, make sure to remind everybody that they should be subject to their rulers. Don't think, hey, I'm part of the kingdom of God now, and the kingdom of God overrules any government and such. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, there are times where if a government becomes wicked— and begins to attempt to force the people of God to deny the Lord Jesus Christ, to deny the Word of God, to reject the teachings of the Word or the practices, the behavior that God calls for in terms of godliness, well then, in those cases, there is a reason for civil disobedience. But even in those cases, it doesn't mean that the people need to necessarily do it in a way of, uh, open protest and attacking the leadership and so on. Uh, no, because Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, you remember, he said, pray for the governing authorities and the rulers that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So there's an attitude of the kingdom of God. The people of God ought to be the easiest to lead. The people of God, believers, ought to be the easiest to govern and lead because they have a humility about them. They have a natural desire to be in compliance with leaders as much as possible. And in most cases, not every case, but in many cases, most cases I'd say it is possible to do. But in some cases it's not because of the leadership being that wicked. So he says here, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey to obey, to be ready for every good work. Verse 2, to speak evil of no one. Boy, that's a powerful thing. To speak evil of no one. Boy, that's not our society, is it? Our society is we can criticize whoever we want to, whenever we want to. But the Bible says here, this is not just Paul to Titus. This is the Holy Spirit to us. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men, all humility to all men. So we need to be humble. It goes on to say in verse 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. So he's saying before we were born again, oh, we lived like the world as well, but we're not like that anymore. But we once did. Lust, we used to serve various lusts and pleasures, just doing what we felt like doing, uh, sexual things, perverse things, what we eat, what we drink, the lifestyle, what we say and such. goes on to say, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Folks, we see a lot of this in our world today. But that shouldn't be us. 
<laughs> Thank God. That shouldn't be us as believers. So you have to be careful who you hang around, who you listen to, because before you know it, you'll become like them. Proverbs says, don't hang around an angry man unless you learn his ways. And so it goes on to say in verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, uh, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, we used to be disobedient. We used to serve various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and such. But when the kindness, oh, don't you love this about the gospel? When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, not by us earning it, uh, which we, uh, we have done, or not by works of righteousness, which we have done, not by us doing works that earned it, but according to his mercy. <laughs> We're saved by God's mercy. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, verse 6, whom he poured out, the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank God that God poured the Holy Spirit out on us abundantly. Verse 7, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain Good works. So notice again what we had addressed before that this extreme grace to where, oh, the grace of God came. Now we don't have to worry about sin because God's already taken care of the sin. So it's okay if you sin in your life, you're under grace. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches, folks. And if you just take a few verses here and there and ignore the rest of the Bible, you might believe that, but it's wrong. And here's one of those places, one of those verses that you have to ignore among many, many, many others. It says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Verse 9, but avoid foolish disputes. Oh, folks, this happens all the time. But avoid foolish disputes. Some disputes are necessary to retain righteousness, but many disputes are not necessary. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are not profitable and useless. They are unprofitable, I should say, and useless, unprofitable and useless. So uh, many of the disputes that we have, people have arguments and everything, doesn't help. It is not profitable. It actually deteriorates. Verse 10, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. What does that mean? Somebody is divisive. Somebody is causing conflict between people. Somebody is argumentative, and you go and you confront them, and uh, you can't win them. You go confront them again. You can't win them. And so it says, reject a divisive, uh, divisive man after the first and second admonition. Give people a couple of opportunities. But if they just refuse to listen, reject them and say, no, we're not going to hang around this person anymore because they're not submitting to the correction that we're bringing to get them in alignment with the ways of God. Verse 11, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self Condemned. They're condemning themselves by their lack of, uh, of submission to authority, their lack of humility, their lack of love for righteousness. Verse 12, when I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nic uh, Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste. Apollos, you remember, was a very uh, eloquent, powerful teacher of the scriptures. So, and Apollos on their journeys with haste, that they may lack nothing. When it says send them, that they may lack nothing, that does, just doesn't mean wave by to them and say, have a nice trip. That means give them the supplies that they need to be able to travel and to come to me, make sure they don't lack anything. Verse 14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, 
so notice again, you need to do good works. Yes, we are under grace, but we need to do good works. And it says, also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. So when there's an urgent need, people, the people of God should be leaning in to help meet an urgent need. Verse 15, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. So Paul has some companions that are with him while he's writing, and he's saying they all greet you. And so anyway, I just love the very personal exchanges here, the very personal comments and greetings that Paul gives, because this shows that it's real. He really knew these people. He really knew Titus, and uh, he was in an ongoing relationship with him. Well, that's the end of the book of Titus. I'm so glad that you joined us today, and I look forward to starting a new book tomorrow. In fact, we'll start it and end it tomorrow. Philemon. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's Word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.